Hello everybody and welcome to Duchess Royale where I share my opinions and receipts on all things really interesting but with a focus on major talking points. Some housekeeping first though, make sure that you like this video, subscribe to the channel and also hit that notification bell so that you know when the next video is out. So let's just dive in. In last month's roundup, I recall saying that if January was anything to go by, then the Sussexes will be the origin of an epidemic of high blood pressure and hypertension in UK royalists. So y'all can just go ahead and call me Miss Cleo, because judging by the tantrums Harry and Meghan caused in UK royalists simply by stepping out in January, I think I may have just been right. Yeah, of course I'm right! But, actually, there were a lot of other reasons for royalists to have hypertension in February, and Harry and Meghan weren't the reason. This video will focus on the main stories in February, of which there were many. Now, I had to grab myself a stiff drink before I put this video together because I wasn't sure where to start with this roundup. And that's because February was a hot, hot mess. But I guess let's just start at the beginning. Barely a week into February and this happened. Breaking news, it's coming to us from Buckingham Palace. King Charles III has been diagnosed with a form of cancer. I really think that this year in the Royal Ends is about expecting the unexpected. And nobody saw this coming on the back of King Charles's successful surgery for an enlarged prostate. The Royal Family typically do not reveal details of medical conditions. So aside from wishing him well, I found this quite interesting. Now, I'm aware that royals see themselves as divinely chosen for their positions. So that comes with this feeling in the royal family that illness makes them look weak. So, for example, in the months before Queen Elizabeth's death, she had mobility issues and needed a wheelchair at times, but she would make sure that she wasn't seen in one. Allegedly, it was bone cancer that she succumbed to in the end, and she ensured that this information was kept private from the public. However, times are changing. Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan have shown that opening up and being vulnerable, like for example with regards to mental health, is relatable and endearing. Charles does not have the mystique that came with the last monarch. So actually, being more open is a case of nothing to lose for him. And with Charles not being a popular monarch, and with support for the monarchy at its lowest ever, at 45%, the goodwill and sympathy from the public from this announcement really had a positive effect. You know, they say you're not supposed to hit a guy with glasses or kick a man when they're down. And I think that him and his handlers will be pleased that his biggest detractors being the Not My King crew might have left him alone for a bit. Other than campaigning online, they really did keep at bay to some extent. Well, they changed their slogan at least from Not My King to Down With The Crown. So, in February, that was the early days of the Where Is Kate saga. Kate Middleton had been missing in action since December. She was last seen on the 25th of December for the Christmas Sandringham Walk. So, since then, there had been loads of conspiracy theories on what had happened to her. And at this stage in February, a well-respected reporter in Spain called Conchita Colleja, well, she believed from her sources that due to a medical operation not going well, Kate had to be put into an induced coma. Now, interestingly, the palace broke their never complain, never explain fake motto that they actually always break, but through royal reporters. Anyway, they did that to deny this, but Conchetta doubled down and maintained that she was telling the truth and that it was the palace that weren't. Now, other people expressed loads of thoughts about what was going on, that Kate Middleton was pushing up daisies or that she was maybe in a mental health facility, which actually was quite interesting since this is something that they would not allow Megan to go to when she specifically asked for that type of help when she was having trouble in the monarchy. Now, Prince William was still in the frame, though, quite negatively. 
There were theories of him asking for a divorce and this leading to some kind of altercation between him and Kate. And there was just so much wild speculation. But what we can be sure of is that Kate's family was not sighted visiting her in the hospital. And the tabloids printed photos of her sister Pippa enjoying a family holiday in St. Bart's. Now, granted, this could have been a decoy. It could have been old photos that the papers just never published in real time. And at that point, wanted to make it look like it was a recent holiday. But the thing is, people love a good unsolved mystery. And because of some of the reports to cover up the Spanish coma story not adding up, the whole thing began to seem really dodgy. And I think that what was light speculation grew into this big royal mystery that's gone far outside the royal watching community to those who don't even follow the royals or aren't really that bothered about them. So what started with a little smoke in the house of Kensington Palace would become a raging fire by March. The emperor, the conqueror, the champion, the lion is here. Hey, And if I'm not mistaken, for the last couple of years, the media have been calling Prince Harry irrelevant, unpopular, someone who would be nothing without his titles, because of course, without his titles, we, we suddenly would lose interest in him, right? Yet the very same media tracked his plane coming into London, camped out at the airport, paparazzi chased his car on foot to take photos. There was even a live stream on Buckingham Palace just for a day for this irrelevant prince. I guess irrelevancy must be slang for most popular in this 2024. It's Prince Harry, people. <laughs> but here are some news reports of his arrival. All eyes were on the royal reunion. Prince Harry landed in London after learning of his dad's diagnosis, the Duke of Sussex arriving at his father's residence alone and leaving less than an hour later. It's the first time the pair is believed to have met since the coronation in May, but it's understood he has no plans to see his brother, Prince William. Prince Harry arrives back in the UK to be with his cancer-stricken father, King Charles, and now many are wondering if it could bring a thaw in their frosty relationship. Harry was photographed pulling up to his father's London residence today after his flight from Los Angeles. The two were said to have had a brief meeting. Now, the only question I have seen all that hoo-ha over his arrival was, who really is King here? And does Harry have rose bearers to drop rose petals at his feet now that he's back in the ghetto on UK soil? Anyway, Harry's arrival in the UK was on the 6th of February. Although brief, it was to see his father after he learned of his father's cancer. Knowing how much of a waste man his father is, I think it was a nice thing to do. I say that because over the last six years, but particularly the last four, I really haven't seen King Charles act like a loving, supportive father. Quite the opposite. However, Harry has always maintained that he loves his family. And despite everything that they've done to him, which caused him to want to leave the UK, he did tell Michael Strahan for GMA that he is no longer angry at them. He knows that on the whole, they are trapped, scared and weak which makes them easily corruptible. But as they say, illnesses can bring families together. That's genuine illnesses, though. Not the kind where you claim you have had a heart attack and then you're pictured at McDonald's the next day. Anyway, I digress. So, Prince William, Kate, the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh all kept mum about King Charles's treatable enlarged prostate. And at this point, his cancer. But there was only ire that Harry hadn't put out a statement. Now, here is a whole segment of a show discussing Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan's silence about King Charles's first routine operation. 
If your sister, if, if, if your I know they're, they're rules, but if your sister was was ill, was having yeah. an operation, would you go on Twitter and, and post and say, "Hey sis, hope you're doing well, best wishes." No, you, you just contact her. No, so, this so, is different. So, the, the, the palace put out a statement. Kensington yeah. Palace put out statements. The Sussexes put out statements. Of course, they can have the private conversation as well. But you would have expected some kind of, you know, the Sussexes yeah, an acknowledgement. Wish, are wishing it, at the moment. The none the of the royals have put out. Apart of, of, you don't go to Beatrice. You don't go to to Andrew. You don't go to the Duke of Edinburgh. No one else has put out statements on social media. Why do you expect Harry and Meghan to do so? Because that's how they do. Because no. that's how Meghan, they, Meghan and Harry do actually get their statements out. Though? What would be, you know, well, that's what I'm saying. You don't have to do... I don't know if no. there's anything that... You're wishing them a speedy recovery, you know, good health and a speedy recovery. Good health and I think at this point, recovery. the other issue here... I'm saying we wish you a speedy recovery. Well, don't we wish you all the best. Well, I, think the that, I, think, like, I think Jeff's right. I think they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. These people are so very strange. Can you remember from the January review when I mentioned how there was annoyance that Prince Harry didn't shoehorn his father and also Kate's health issue into his living legend of aviation award speech? So you would think that these right wing royalists would be happy that Prince Harry was actually prepared to come and see his father in person rather than by Zoom. And, you know, to some extent they were. Until they learnt that he'd only spent 45 minutes with him, then up and left the ghetto, back to sunny Montecito within less than 24 hours. That's Prince Harry at London's Heathrow Airport. He is jetting back home to Meghan and his children. And as Amber Cagliano reports, he spent less than 24 hours in the UK for a short visit with his father, King Charles, who's battling cancer. Now to the media, the whistle-stop nature of Harry's visit was an insult. I believe they took this as yet another rejection of them by Harry and also a rejection of the wish for Harry to want to be in the royal fold. Now, if your old man had received this worrying health news, would you find 30 minutes long enough to express your love? I'd be bedded in for days, making cups of tea, fetching warm blankets and reminding him ad nauseam what he means to me. Harry, just... Just come home. There's time of your family going through this real hardship with your father having cancer and just come home. But it showed that his intention was never to hang around. That he, he wasn't that bothered, even though they'd spent so much time in the news predicting that he was going to stay around and hoping that he would. In all of these situations where Harry has done a whistle stop visit, showing that he's in control of his own time and he's booked and busy, the media always so predictably eventually turn the narrative to make it seem that it's the royal family that has the upper hand and that Prince Harry is the rejected one. And so they put Harry in a position of weakness. So in their annoyance, they claimed that the meeting with Harry was only 45 minutes because Charles was annoyed that Harry had visited him at such short notice. And they made it seem like Prince Harry imposed himself on a reluctant father that didn't really want to see him. So there we go again with the loving father image. Now, it's humorous to watch the reports of the media cutting the time that he was said to have with Charles gradually and gradually. And that's just because the media create fiction. They just make stuff up. So we had headlines like this one that said he spent 30 minutes with him. This other one that said 45 and then as this man said... The 12 minutes that he spent with his father. So you see how British propaganda works. They just repeat the lies over and over enough times until it's believed as the truth. Prince Harry would have stayed in the safe haven of his former home, Frogmore Cottage, which is currently sitting empty, which has security built in, if dear pa didn't take it away from him. But... I believe that he, if he had that as a base, he wouldn't be breaking all these records left, right and centre for how quickly he comes into the UK and how quickly he skedaddles out. See, the problem is that with the royal family and the UK media, they created this toxic environment and unfavourable arrangements. And they thought that they had one over on Prince Harry when they were really playing themselves. They were jubilant that his home had been taken, thinking that that would force him to stay on palace grounds in the heart of courtier land every time he came over. And there they would undoubtedly track his whereabouts, make up stories on his stay, brief the press from palace sources. 
Right, we don't quite know where Harry uh, is tonight, despite our best efforts to, um, to find out. But Harry just finds a way to slip out of their control. And he just said, nah, I'll stay somewhere else and I'll dip in and I'll dip out. But the amount of stories that the media created just on his 24-hour stay makes me wonder, what would it have been like if he'd stayed longer? Now, Prince William vowed to take months off to look after Kate and the children. But three weeks into that pledge, he was back at what he calls work. So he did this investiture thingy in the morning, looking a little bit rough and swaying like he was ready to fall down and go back to sleep. Maybe looking after Kate and the kids with his 60 staff and nannies is really hard work. But his presentation only fueled the mystery over Kate Middleton because he looked a mess. He dropped awards as he was handing them out and together with the swaying, many people suspected that he was drunk. It was also suspect that all of a sudden, Piers Morgan came out later on with a story about how Prince William used to drink at a young age. Anyway... Whatever the case, William obviously fixed up because in the evening he attended the London Air Ambulance Charity Gala. Now, I suspect that that was the only reason that he'd come out in the day because it would have been questionable if he'd only come out for the party. Prince William has actually been quite a regular attendee of this event, but this year it really felt very much like his presence was a desperate response to Harry attending the Living Legend Awards and being inducted as an actual living legend of aviation way back in January. Now, it's funny that old pesky jealousy and one-sided competition with Harry, the spur who is fun, cool, relatable and legendary, against the heir who is none of the above. I believe that Prince William wanted to show that, me too, I can fly planes. Well, I can fly a helicopter. And I think that he wanted to remind people that he worked for the air ambulance, although probably not the part where it was just for two years. It was part time, 16 hours a week, just enough to claim job seekers allowance. Anyway, it doesn't really compare to Harry graduating from flying different kinds of planes to eventually flying an Apache plane. But he just wanted to be seen as an aviator. And I think that if it could possibly work, he might have used the event to pimp himself out to anyone in power that could get him noticed by the living legend of Aviation Award organisers or make them think that he's just as worthy of being in that Hall of Fame. Therefore, it just so happened that, shock horror, rent a friend Tom Cruise, who has never attended this ceremony before, just showed up like that. Tom is guess what? Yep. Also an inductee of the living legend of Aviation Hall of Fame. Would you look at that synergy? Good planning, right? So Prince William gave a speech at this event with a quick mention of his colleague Kate and a brief mention of his father, which it was reported that at this stage he hadn't yet visited. Instead, he spent more time talking with his renter friend Tom Cruise, Yet, of course, no criticism from the press. But kudos to William for finding an A-list celebrity like Tom Cruise that seems wholly enamoured with the welfare royals and seems to be on call whenever they need him. Now, the media who have this invisible contract with William knew his vision. And yes, William was deified on the front pages of the newspapers the next day. It was pathetically transparent, with the sun going fully unhinged, with a picture of William and Tom Cruise together, and a title that said, Top Son. Of course, a dig at Prince Harry. Now, that's despite the fact that it was Prince Harry, the son that travelled 11,000 miles to see his father to spend a little amount of time with him, while his son, that pledged to be his dad's liege, was reported not to have seen his father post his diagnosis. I, William, Prince of Wales, pledge my loyalty to you and faith and truth I will bear unto you as your liege man of life and limb. So help me God. It just looked like while his dad was sick, he was on a date with Cruz, who seems to be everywhere. But what was obvious was that Prince William came out of one of those five residents of his to attend this charity gala for the PR that it would give him 
rather than the actual cause. You see, the newspapers barely mentioned the London Air Ambulance Workers, but instead, William in his tux and his rent a Hollywood aviation star were splashed over the cover. Not a peep of an ambulance crew member who attended. But instead, the Sun unearthed old photos of William in his helicopter days, just to remind and embed those images in your mind in order to compete with those of Harry flying an Apache. Well, if that was supposed to elevate him over and above his brother, Prince Harry said, <laughs> I said earlier, expect the unexpected. And with Harry one minute in the UK and the next on the big stage in Las Vegas at the NFL Honours Award, he was really living up to that saying and also his new official title as a living legend. Harry is naturally relatable. He's humorous and he's a good orator. He certainly learned from No Notes Megan. I really love how you, uh, you stole rugby from us and, <laughs> and you made it your own. Of course, the right-wingers, the royals and the royalists with unwashed legs were apoplectic. But uh, people are just shocked by this. This is, I just think this is inappropriate, don't well, you? Especially seeing Cam Hayward's funny and viral reaction to being awarded by the Prince Harry. Oh, man. Man. Prince freaking Harry. <laughs> man, I'm, uh... I'm in shock. That's, that's Prince Harry. Uh. Let's be honest. The monarchists are angry because Harry's charming. Please welcome the Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year, Cam the Man Haywood. And like I said before, he's relatable and popular. He's everything the monarchy needs right now to revive its dying and dated ship. And Harry's walked away and he's taken his charm and he's bestowed it on the American people. This attendance of Harry, although not intended, was a remote slap in the face to William the monarchy, the anti-Sussex royalists and the British media. I almost felt bad for them. Prince William, in his one-way competition with Harry, thought that his local event with his one repeat friend for hire, Tom Cruise, attending, would put him on par with Harry's living legend of aviation night, or near enough. It didn't. But only for Harry to turn up to a massive Las Vegas Hollywood event full of the creme de la creme a-list football stars too. And not just be there, but present the top award of the night. And then have a big, credible sportsman literally fanboying him on the stage. Things like that just continue to demolish the right wing and the troll narrative that they work so very hard to create and repeat over and over again so that the lie could potentially become true. And that is that apparently... No one likes Prince Harry or Meghan and that Hollywood is shunning them and, of course, of them being irrelevant. Clearly not. It's just sad that, you know, sad that William had to virtually be blown out of the park like that in just a matter of days. It's just not the same league and it brings back the visions of him wading in the Hudson River of the United States of America or hanging outside the UN General Assembly last September hoping to get noticed. Beforehand, the British media had been excited about Prince William going to an event with other celebrities while his dad was sick and his colleague Kate was healing from whatever she was going through at that time. But Prince Harry going to a star-studded event was apparently disrespectful, vulgar and inappropriate and whatever shouty words you can think of. And I would imagine this tawdry appearance in Las Vegas absolutely inappropriate. I don't think that any person should drop everything their life ends just because their father is suffering. Uh, but there is a, a way to behave and this is not it. That was, it's outrageous. Let's be real here. They're also angry because Harry left the welfare royals and he still managed because of his persona crafted over 39 years to be in the room and on the stage that they know that the welfare royals are locked out of. Harry is sitting with the cool kids, but the welfare royals can't sit with them. <laughs> with the diminishing popularity of the monarchy, 
the NFL demographic is one that they could only dream of having, especially as they have a greater interest in increasing their popularity in America and decreasing the Sussexes since they moved there. They also want that cool, fresh and younger generation. That's also why they complained that Harry, while there to give an honour before a room full of people who have no connection or allegiance to a king of another country, England, that he should have spoken about his father's recent diagnosis. Now, I just really cannot understand this coming from people that are supposed to be professional journalists. But the royalist British media are mad because they want to ride off Prince Harry's clout and get him to help revive and promote the monarchy and make America care about it and be as interested in it as they are in Harry and to think it's cool. They're so transparent that they always end up telling on themselves. Had he said, found some kind, genuine words for his sister-in-law, who was recovering from what has obviously been major surgery at the London Clinic, if he'd done that, that would have gone down a storm because Kate, the Princess of Wales, has a, 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 an affirmative, a positive rating in America of 35%. That means that 35% people more like her than dislike her. And that's very, very high indeed. And a recent poll showed that her husband, uh, Prince William, the Prince of Wales, he is the most popular man in America. And that is extraordinary. And had he said that, I think uh, he would have got tremendous applause. There we see it. Oh, God, that man really did say that Prince William is the most popular man in America. <laughs> so, sorry about that. I'm back. I'm back now. I'm back now. It's just that I, I actually don't know what to say about that. He's barely known there outside of the Anglophile community in America. I don't know if he's just manifesting or it's just the highest level of Delulu. But Prince Harry is not promoting these people in the States. But if William is the most popular man, it's not detrimental that he wasn't mentioned then. You know, I just wish that they would pick a lane. One minute the event is tawdry, the next minute they're mad that at said tawdry event, he didn't mention the Welfare Royals. Well, there you go. Lots and lots of jokes. Never once mentioned his dad mm -hmm. uh, or indeed his uh, sister-in-law, Kate, uh, Princess of Wales, who's obviously uh, suffering and recovering from abdominal surgery. One of the most humorous things was how they tried to reverse psychology and tried to imply that not name-dropping the welfare royals was Harry missing a trick for himself. Uh, I would like to be able to say the boy done well but he missed uh, two, possibly three own goals there because had he in front of that crowd in Las Vegas, having just come from seeing his father, have said something about his condition and wished him well, that would have gone down hugely well with that crowd. And it's so obvious that against what they say, deep down, they know that Prince Harry is widely respected in the States and globally. Yeah, Prince freaking Harry. I'm freaking out right now. And music and up you go. To announce. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex. Secret is Get out. It. The secret is out. It's Prince Harry, people. <laughs> uh. Your speech was phenomenal, and I was kind of with you like, this is Prince freaking Harry. <laughs> uh, were you surprised to see Prince Harry there? I was, I really was, honestly. I didn't, I didn't expect that. Team, team Harry. And that him mentioning King Charles and Kate will be seen as an endorsement. But even if Harry wanted to, how do you shoehorn into a speech? My papa is sick and my Regina George-like sister-in-law is supposedly in bed working from home. Probably creating a mood board of Meghan's last outfits. She's recovering from abdominal surgery and jealousy. All I know is that most of the time, those haters, they like to pretend that Harry should keep the welfare royals out of his mouth. And he did. So what's the problem, son?
At this point in February, we hadn't even reached the second week. And with every day that ended with a Y, these pesky royalists have found something else to be angry about. This time round, it was the sleek new website that Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan quietly dropped a day after the Super Bowl. The website, a revamp of their old site, archiewell.com, well, it's sleeker, more informative and more professional looking. But sweetheart, it's literally just a website that these people have burst blood vessels over. And why is that? Well, it's simply because they refer to themselves by the titles titles that they've been known as since they were married and which they have continued to be known by since stepping back from the welfare royal unit. And secondly, because the new website address is comprised of only the name of the town that forms part of their title, so Sussex, as in Sussex.com. It's also quite silly, really, because they haven't done anything dramatic. As usual, the media create the drama to make it look like the Sussexes have done something wrong. You see, when it came to the Sanjanum summit in 2019, and all the things that were taken from Harry and Meghan or they weren't supposed to use, they adhered to it. That hasn't changed. They were told not to use their HRH titles. They haven't. They were told not to use their Sussex Royal website. They didn't. They just parked it, so it's literally in abeyance with no further posts uploaded. There was absolutely no rule that they were not allowed to use their coats of arms, Sussex, which is the name given to them by the Queen and which they have given to their two children so that they can all have the same surname. The thing is, the royalist response is just sour grapes because... Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan have done amazing things and their revamped website looks amazingly polished and regal. Now, they have complained that it looks royal, but they are royal. The only thing is that they're not working or welfare royals. They're independently financed royals. So the Monas cannot go back in time to the Sandringham summit when they thought that they had stripped them, leaving them with very little, and try and go back and take what's left behind. And that's what's annoying them. In the Netflix Harry and Meghan documentary, the Sussexes revealed that they themselves offered to give back their dukedom titles and that wasn't taken. So why are they complaining now? I'd mentioned that, you know, if this wasn't going to work out, then we would be willing to relinquish our Sussex titles if need be. They hadn't done anything wrong, but in order to justify the moaning and to demonise the Sussexes, Desperate royal reporters, as usual, weaponised the late Queen against them and put out headlines like this, which implied that they were nearly, nearly in breach of their agreement with her. But it's silly to put that out anyway, because they're either in breach or they're not, and they're not. Personally, I do believe that they know that these titles don't make or break Harry, and particularly after all the other non-working royals haven't been successful with their titles. And their documentary was the most streamed documentary on Netflix in 2022. And they managed to do that while it was titled Harry and Meghan, not the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. These people just need to get real because the only way is up for the Sussexes. Shortly after the website was released, we also had more breaking news of a new podcast deal for Megan. So that follows just one season of Archetypes, which was exclusively for Spotify. Now, this new deal is with Lemonada Media. And the two things I will say is that apart from looking forward to what her new shows will be like and what themes she's going to explore, this deal has the benefit of her not being exclusive to one platform so that a wider audience can get to hear her podcast. So she must have had ownership of the Archetype series, which is a good move, good business move on her part, because it's now been rolled out across all platforms and she has already risen to the top of the charts in various categories. We don't have a date yet for when her new podcast will roll out, but I guess we'll see what happens in due course. The Sussexes touched down in Vancouver, I think on either the 12th or the 13th of February, ready to use their star power 
to promote ahead of time the 2025 Invictus Games in the snowy mountains of Whistler where they headed to. Those mountains look gorgeous and although I initially turned my nose up at the games taking place somewhere that cold, even for just two days of the games it looks just so scenic and beautiful and as well as that most of the events including new winter sports will be different, edgy and some are daredevilish. So it really does feel like Invictus 2025 will be more special than usual and will certainly be an interesting game. Aside from the usual inspiring stories of the athletes, which we will see in abundance next year, it was just nice to see Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan looking really fresh-faced in really cool clothes, stylish and living their lives while promoting such a worthy cause. Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan also went out to celebrate Valentine's and they had a double date with the Boublés, who they are friends with. And there was also a special treat later on in the week where at the Invictus Gala to round off the event, Michael Bublé serenaded Prince Harry with a fitting reworded rendition of My Way by Frank Sinatra. Sage, on history's pen. They give cause every beach. <laughs> we call him Harry. <laughs> it's true. Harry, it's you. Your follow through. Opens hope's doorway. Passions flow. One thing we know is to stay the hell out of your <laughs> way. Do check out the full version of that rendition somewhere online. But what I'm interested in is, does anyone know if Tom Cruise can sing? Just asking for a friend. <laughs> Another highlight of this trip was the GMA interview Prince Harry did with Will Reeves. Tomorrow morning, a GMA exclusive, Prince Harry, the all new interview on his life today with Meghan, how his father, the King, is doing, and on his passion, supporting wounded warriors. Tomorrow on Good Morning America. But as soon as this trailer dropped, the starved British media knew they were going to be fed, and TV pundits started sowing their seeds of discord and suggesting that Prince Harry would invade King Charles's privacy, talking about his cancer. Of course, they knew he wouldn't, but it's all in order to keep the hate pumping through the veins of the haters, which helps pay their bills through clickbait, as well as gives them gratification in lashing out at Harry. This is what he actually said. What's sort of your outlook on, on his health? That stays between me and him. This is where it was so evident that the right-wing whingers actually want Harry to do certain things that are more easy to criticise him about. Because after complaining all of February and January that Harry should have mentioned his father on the various stages that he was on, when he did, in a good and discreet way in this interview, they claimed that he had been disrespectful and that he had breached King Charles's privacy. I was like... I mean, it was so ridiculous that even decent news outlets were making fun of the British press and people. Check out this headline from New York magazine, which said, Prince Harry has reportedly angered the royals by saying nice things about King Charles in a Good Morning Mer America interview. Although he offered no details on the King's cancer diagnosis in his interview today, people are still mad. That's the haters. On a serious note, this does confirm, actually, that if Harry resolved all the world wars and natural disasters, they would still only write bad press because when he did something they were complaining that he should do from before, they were still not happy. Now, in more news about how the British media will see a blue sky and report that it's green to push their favoured narrative, in February, once again, they managed to turn a comment where Prince Harry said this. I've got you know, other trips planned um, that would take me through the UK or back to the UK. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll stop in and, and see my family as much as I can. Well, they turned that into headlines that Harry is desperate to come back to do royal duties. 
Now, the backstory to this is that they have always wanted this. They want him to come back. But since the senior members of the Welfare Royals are dropping like flies, it's enabled TV presenters to start all manner of conversations asking if Harry would come back and, in quotes, help out. Mm -mm, get some ideas to do it. Oh. Of course, the entire British media like to forget that Prince Harry actually left the UK for a reason. That includes bad things being done to him by his family and still being done by them. And of course, secondly, that Harry is now a married man with children. He's got Meghan, he's got Prince Archie and Princess Lilibet Diana living with them in a whole other continent. Minor matters, I suppose, to the royalists. But every time Harry enters the UK, he seems to break his own record of how fast he can leave and get back to Montecito. This man literally said that his life is in the USA with his wife and his children. How have you processed the fact that there's so much happening back uh, with your family where you come from? I have my own family, right. so, as we all do. Yeah. Right? So, um, you know, my family and my life in California is, is, is as it is. But in an effort to reverse this narrative, which hurts the esteem of the royalists, this GMA interview inspired a reworked narrative for them. Now, Harry clearly emphasised in that interview that he has a family in California and he implied that he prioritises them above his father and his brother, who he's estranged from. I mean, this guy got it. I just enjoying the way he says, I've got my own family. Well, yes, he's, but he's part of a bigger family. I find that really sad that he just sort of almost excludes that. I, I actually think that uh, the British people was desperately sad to lose Harry. It was an absolute tragedy for them and, and for us as a nation. In fact, he was so popular. But Kate Manzi is the troll journalist who wrote an article before saying that Prince Harry was trying to get taxpayer funded security when in actual fact he was trying to pay for it himself. Well, that propelled him to take legal action against her. But she, on this matter, had claimed that she heard from people who know Prince Harry. Now, that could be Prince William. You know, she heard from them that Harry is keen to come back to work for the very people that tried to unalive not just his wife, but also him. Okay. He is keen to be reconciled with his father and has been telling people that he wants a return, that he's happy to step in in some sort of temporary royal role while his father's away unwell. It's like Harry has done so many interviews, including this last one, that indicates that that is the last thing he wants to do to return to the ghetto. No way. Can you see a day when you would return as a full-time member of the royal family? No. How are you enjoying your time living in the US? It's amazing. I love every single day. He spoke very clear English there. So he needs to start asking these British journalists. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? It seems convenient that this narrative of him wanting to return was concocted just at a time when they specifically need him. But Harry has demonstrated that he's not interested and this reworked narrative helps them save face and further to do the upper hand narrative of saying that, oh, sorry, Harry wants us, but we don't want him when they desperately do. The headlines with this likely mistruth has fueled various TV and radio discussions on should Harry be let back into the royal fold? And that's on the basis that Harry was begging for this when he wasn't. Prince William, of course, not having one jot of it. Saying absolutely not. He's quashed any prospect of a royal reconciliation. It's so strange watching grown folk make up stuff and then discuss the stuff they've made up, knowing it's made up, and then get angry about the stuff that they made up, just in order to make the lesser royals look powerful. Yep, they very much framed it as Mr. Incandescent with Rage, Prince William being the person that holds all the cards and the person that would stop Harry coming back if he wanted to. 
Now, I guess they got to do what they got to do, but we all know that Harry is booked and busy. And the only people that he will go and work for free for and on a permanent basis is Prince Archie and Princess Lilibet Diana. And of course, his beautiful wife, Duchess Meghan. Prince William cut a lonely figure as he attended the BAFTAs on Sunday the 18th of February. Now, last year he went with Kate, who practically molested him on the red carpet in a bid to pretend that she's still attracted to him and that they're still happily married. Uh, again, she was trying to emulate the natural affection that the Sussexes have for one another, which is always criticised, I think, out of jealousy. What she was doing that night lacked so much class. During the event, the 41-year-old royal gives Prince William a gentle pat on his butt while walking the red carpet. The quick moment was captured by Vogue and later seen in photos and videos from the event, which was held at the Royal Festival Hall. Yeah, I have digressed a little bit, but a little bit of a flashback because I remember a time when holding hands at a funeral would be deemed as inappropriate. The hand-holding in Westminster Hall was the strangest thing I've ever seen. It was totally incongruent with everybody else for their distancing and their placement. And I would have thought that people don't hold hands in a situation like that. But tapping that ass on a red carpet, that's practically perfectly fine. Anyway, now this should have been a straightforward night, really. You turn up, you get pictured with high-profile celebrities so that stories can be concocted that these acquaintances are your friends. You speak to people backstage, congratulate them on their wins. Then you go home and mark off that event off on your event engagement tally. Simple. But even the simplest things are a stretch for Prince William. And apart from getting little attention from celebrities who seemed unbothered by his presence, Despite his oh-so-powerful title, from that night, this picture of Prince William and the girls from the Rising Star BAFTA category went viral, majorly so. So there is the Daily Mail article which said, Awkward gaff for Prince William as he tells actress who won BAFTA for heroin coming-of-age film How to Have Sex, which ends with her being odd, that making the movie looked like a lot of fun, but admits he hasn't seen it yet. Ish. For him to be in a picture with these girls, with those looks on their faces, is so on brand for him. It has always been Harry that's been able to vibe with people from all demographics, but this man, unfortunately, comes across like toast without butter. After his BAFTA gaff, you would think that this guy who has a talent for putting his foot in his mouth would sit out wading into one of the most difficult and controversial world conflicts, being the Israel and Gaza situation. Instead, on the 20th of February, he brought out a statement that became breaking the news. Now, viewers, I want to bring you some more breaking news, and it's uh, a new statement from the Prince of Wales. Let me read it out to you in full. It's just arrived uh, here at Sky News, and it reads as follows. I remain deeply concerned about the terrible human cost of the conflict in the Middle East since the Hamas terror attacks on the 7th of October. Too many have been killed. I, like so many others, want to see an end to the fighting as soon as possible. There is a desperate need for increased humanitarian support to Gaza. It's critical. Aid gets in and the hostages are released. Sometimes, it is only when faced with the sheer scale of human suffering that the importance of permanent peace is brought home. Even in the darkest hour, we must not succumb to the counsel of despair. I continue to cling to the hope that a brighter future can be found and refuse to give up on that. That is a statement from uh, William the Prince of Wales laying out just how concerned he is about the ongoing crisis in Gaza. It looks and sounds good and polished, but really and truly, he said a whole lot of nothing here, and it was very both sides and reinforced more or less the basic public sentiment, and also what the government was heading towards saying anyway. But despite that, it was breaking news everywhere because 
This wasn't the teetering around politics that the royals normally do. This was wading into the shallow ends of murky waters. So many questions were raised here. Why now? Why this conflict? There are so many that can be highlighted. This GB News presenter actually made some good points here when talking about Prince William's new route. As they say, a broken clock is right twice a day. Now, look, this is the strongest response to the war by a senior royal, Emily, but he's had to do some damage control because royal aides have had to clarify that he's not calling for a two-state solution or for a <clears throat> ceasefire. Was it a poor move? Well, this is the problem. His statement was quite vague, which left it very much open to interpretation. And Israel, their spokesperson, came back and said, of course, we want to stop the fighting like you do. But of course, there are conditions to that. I personally think that he perhaps should not have released such a statement. It opens him up to accusations of political bias, political meddling. It's very important that our future king is not seen to meddle in what is very important constitutionally for him not to be political. I personally believe this is a misstep from our future king. And also, if he comments on this ongoing conflict, which of course is hugely controversial, hugely contest contentious, opens up huge amounts of emotion from across the political spectrum, across the world indeed, does he then comment on every ongoing conflict? I think this puts him in a difficult position. Call me cynical, but this did not appear at all genuine. And I'm actually going to discuss this in a separate video, so I'll keep this section short. Thomas Kingston, husband of Lady Gabriella and previously dated Pippa Middleton, has died. He was 45 years old. The son-in-law of Prince and Princess Michael of Kent was found dead on Sunday at his parents' home in Gloucestershire. Thomas was a director at a private equity firm. Lady Gabriella Windsor is the daughter of Princess Michael of Kent. You know, the royal who liked wearing racist brooches and did so on her first meeting with the new biracial duchess, Meghan. I'm very much not a racist fan. Um, okay. Anyway, this is quite sad for Lady Gabriella, who had only been married to him for around five years. This unfortunate ending to the month of February was also a little bit of a creepy one. Alongside this news, there was also news that Prince William, who was due to attend his godfather, King Constantine of Greece's memorial service, and to do a reading, cancelled at the very last minute. In the UK, the Prince of Wales, Prince William, has cancelled an official engagement because of a, quote, personal matter. Prince William was due to give a reading at the service. King Constantine was his godfather, but he pulled out, citing a personal matter. And the palace had been pretty tight-lipped about it, but it must be something big and important for him to pull out of this memorial service, not only for his uh, godfather, but doing an important reading as well. The Princess of Wales, still recovering from abdominal surgery, is said to be doing well. Now, cancelling an engagement at the last minute is unprecedented for royals, especially keeping the reason under wraps and just saying it's personal. Of course, the internet is going to go wild and speculate, and that's what the internet did. The media tried their best to quash linking this to Kate's health by ensuring that the public were told that she was doing well, even though she hadn't been seen, still. But the strangest thing was that they kind of said that there was no connection to Thomas Kingston's death to Prince William's non-attendance at the memorial. How did we get here? Then there were articles soon after that with headlines like this. What happens if William commits a serious crime? Hmm. I mean, if the media is trying to put water on a conspiracy theorist over the disappearance of Kate and the death of a member of the royal family, well, they did a really bad job. And there were lots of people out there smelling a rat. You win some and you let some go. And Harry did drop one of his minor, lesser personal lawsuits against the Daily Mail over security. That's the one that I mentioned earlier with Kate Menzies and the incorrect headline. He expressed that he wanted to focus on the lawsuits that were more important to him. And in that same month of February, he actually did win a big settlement from his case against the Mirror.
Uh, that Prince Harry has settled the remaining parts of his phone hacking claim against the publisher of the Daily Mirror and won further substantial damages. The Duke of Sussex had claimed journalists at the Mirror Group newspaper's publications were linked to methods including phone hacking, uh, so-called blagging, that's uh, gaining information by deception, and uh, use of private investigators for unlawful activities. In December, a judge ruled that phone hacking became widespread at MGM titles in the late 90s. Outside court, his lawyer, David Sherborne, delivered a statement on his behalf. After our victory in December, Mirror Group have finally conceded the rest of my claim, which would have consisted of another two trials, additional evidence and 115 more articles. Everything we said was happening at Mirror Group was in fact happening, and indeed far worse, as the court ruled in its extremely damaging judgment. As the judge has said only this morning, we have uncovered and proved the shockingly dishonest way in which the Mirror acted for so many years and then sought to conceal the truth. In light of this, we call again for the authorities to uphold the rule of law and to prove that no one is above it. That includes Mr Morgan, who as editor knew perfectly well what was going on as the judge held. Even his own employer realised it simply could not call him as a witness of truth at the trial. His contempt for the court's ruling and his continued attacks ever since demonstrate why it was so important to obtain a clear and detailed judgment. As I said back in December, our mission continues. I believe in the positive change it will bring for all of us. And just to finish off with some cute news, Meghan was featured in an Akizura shoe ad. Can you spot the Duchess? Well, Akizura shoes are the shoes that Meghan put on the map. She wore them in her pre-royal days and Kate Middleton, who used to dress like a Stepford wife, succumbed to the Meghan effect and started wearing the shoes herself. As we know, typically this is that project to blur the lines and make it look like actually she's the person who started the trend and that's in her ongoing Megan style colonizer strategy you know what they say black women out here trying to save everybody and what do we get swagger jacked by white girls Anyway, other than that, Meghan was spotted several times around Beverly Hills, enjoying what looked like business meetings or lunch with friends. Uh, we'll see what's to come from that. Woohoo! February has been a packed month, so this has been a long video. We already know that the March video is going to be messy still. But for now, that's all for this video and I'm going to get myself a drink. So thank you for watching. I hope you liked the video. Please do like it, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so you know when the next video is out and leave a comment. Let me know what you think and I will see you in the next video. Until then, peace and I'm out.